Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I've got a project that I want to do to hopefully fulfill two purposes. Number one, build a small form factor Arduino compatible board with USB-C capabilities, and two, practice my lacking micro soldering skills. Let's get right into it, shall we? To start this project, I of course needed a PCB to solder on. I was unsure of the exact model of official Arduino board that I would build mine around, but I eventually settled on the Arduino Nano because it's such a simple, capable, and versatile board. And with Arduino's awesome open source schematics, I was able to copy the circuit diagram in my EDA software relatively easily. One of the two main differences in my design compared to the Arduino's is that I have some more pins on my board than the official Nano, and these pins are extra power and ground pins, which I think are quite useful when prototyping circuits. And the second difference, which I've mentioned in the intro, title, and likely the thumbnail as well at this point, is the fact that I've switched out the mini USB port for a USB Type-C connector. This is because it's just a nicer connector to have on a microcontroller, and if I'm going to build my own Arduino-like boards, I should at least try to make them special in one way or another. Though let me quickly be entirely transparent and say that a USB-C Arduino is not an original idea. I don't want to come across as if I'm the first person to come up with this because I am not. Sadly, this USB-C port is unable to take advantage of the USB-C power delivery protocol, as I've never dealt with that protocol in one of my designs before, so I have absolutely no clue where to start, and I also didn't want to incorporate more chips onto the board than it already had, as I could see that becoming a trace routing nightmare. In any case, I got to designing the PCB, and after trying really hard to route the traces in the original Nano's footprint, this was also before adding the extra power and ground pins, I had to give in. My design software doesn't let me do four layers or PCBs without paying a fortune, thanks Autodesk, and therefore I'd have to squeeze everything into the two layers I had available. But sadly, that wasn't something I was able to figure out quite yet, and even though I'm decent at designing PCBs, I'm absolutely no master. So I had to compromise a little on the size of this board. It's now a nano-ish board. I made it the same width as a Raspberry Pi Pico with a little added length to make routing easier. And because of this extra length, this is when I decided to add those extra power and ground pins because otherwise it would look a little weird and just be an inefficient use of space. Finally, with a PCB designed, I went over to PCBWay.com to order my boards. PCBWay is the sponsor of today's video and provided great quality PCBs that I'll be using in this video. I've used PCBWay's services for several of my projects, and every time the quality has been flawless. Whether you're looking for PCB manufacturing, 3D printing, CNC machining, or even sheet metal cutting, which I hope to try out soon, PCBWay has your back with their impeccable quality and reasonable prices. Check them out at the link in the description below. Now, since half the goal of this project is to give myself some room to practice my SMD soldering skills, I'm going to spend a reasonable amount of time on the soldering for these boards. I also made sure to mostly limit myself to only SMD components to give myself the biggest challenge possible. The only two exceptions to this rule were the pin headers and the crystal oscillator. I've got an abundance of 16 megahertz through hole crystal oscillators that I want to use up, so I didn't go out and buy new SMD ones for this project. So now I'm going to need a place to start on this board. So what should I solder first? Well, I think that the obvious answer in this case would be the ATmega328P chip, as it's one of the more complex soldering jobs on the board. Having the most room around the pins to get them accurately connected will be helpful, so I'm planning to start there. After positioning the chip on the board, I used a tiny bit of solder to try and tack one of the pins down. The joint was anything but good, however the purpose of it at this point is to just keep the chip from moving while I solder the rest of it, and later in the process I'll redo this joint. Now, if you've watched some of my other project videos before, you've probably heard me mention that I really haven't done micro soldering much. I'm trying to learn right now, so before roasting me in the comments of this video, please understand that this is the first SMD board I've ever fully soldered. Minus my filming lights, though those were very large SMD LED chips and therefore not too much of a challenge, so I don't really count them. After using a bit of flux on all the pins and then soldering them with the tip of my soldering iron, I was actually pretty pleased with how the 328P came out. They're not the prettiest solder joints imaginable, but for a first timer's hand soldered joints, I think I didn't do a terrible job. The next component that I wanted to solder on was the USB-C port. I had to get slightly different ports than the one that the footprint in this board is modeled after, so I had to clip the shield and support pins slightly. Hopefully they'll still make sufficient contact to hold the port securely in place. I tinned two of the pads on the board and then used those as anchor spots for the port. With the port not moving and grooving all over the place, I did my best to get some of the support pins soldered down. I got the front two connected to their pads quite good, though the back ones didn't want to flow very nicely. 
I just couldn't manage to get enough heat into the joint it seemed, and I didn't want to damage the plastic insides of the port with hot air. Hopefully this will be sufficient support for now. But anyways, after that was done, I finished the soldering of the USB ports, actual data and power pins, which is really hard. These USB-C ports have super tiny pins, and this is definitely something that I would like to work on more in the future. Now it was time for the FTDI chip the FT232RL. I went with this chip rather than a cheaper chip like the CH340G for the sake of simplicity because digital circuitry and communications are not remotely close to my strong suit. I wanted something that's proven to be a robust and functional option. They were kind of expensive at $5 a piece, but I only bought a few of them, so it was mostly okay. Though I will say, the fact that this little strip of three whole chips was $15 is a little wild to me. The FTDI's soldering job was about the same as the 328P's, and therefore it wasn't too hard to solder. The pins are thinner and closer together though, so solder bridging was a bit more of an issue. Next it was on to the smaller components, such as capacitors, resistors, and LEDs. These were all super easy, but a decent part of that is probably due to the fact that I could see what I was doing because I've got a microscope for this. All of these components were in either the 0805 package or the 1206 package for some of the larger capacitors. I chose these packages as they are very standard packages and they're also recognized as being quite hand soldering friendly. I could have gone for the extra challenge and chose some smaller parts, but I bought all of these components in bulk assortments, so having extra 0805 size parts available for other projects is nicer than having a ton of microscopic components that I may never use. The only other two special-ish SMD parts that I had to solder in along my passive component stuffing journey were the 5 volt voltage regulator and a small diode. Both of these parts were exceptionally easy to get soldered down as the voltage regulator is in a pretty large package and the diode is not much smaller than a 0805 component. The last thing I added was the crystal, which I forgot got to record and then I went back to my comfort zone for a minute and put the pin headers on the board, which I also seem to have forgotten to record. Eh, none of us are here for the boring through hole soldering anyway, so let's see if this board works at all. Since I bought completely blank microcontroller chips straight out of the manufacturing line, there's no bootloaders burned onto them. In order for a board like this to work with Arduino, you need to have bootloaders on the chips, otherwise they just aren't gonna function. So I grabbed a second Arduino, which in this case I chose to be an Arduino Nano, and hooked it up in the bootloader burning configuration. The real Nano, which is still a knockoff, but you get what I mean, will connect via ISP to the DIY one and flash the bootloader. This means that the real Nano and the DIY Nano need to have pins 13, 12, 11, 5 volts and ground connected directly across from one board to another. Then the real nano needs to have its pin 10 connected to my DIY board's reset pin and it should, in theory, be good to go. I tried to perform the regular bootloader burning process, which involves loading the Arduino ISP example sketch to the real nano, then setting the bootloader settings for the bootloader receiving board that we're programming. After that, in the tools menu, set the programmer to Arduino as ISP and lastly hit burn bootloader. I did all of this, however, it didn't work as smoothly as I wanted it to. AVR dude was getting the wrong signature from the chip and was erroring out because of it. I'm going to gloss over some really long troubleshooting, but I realized eventually that this was occurring because I had ATmega 328PB chips rather than the 328P. I didn't realize that these chips would behave differently, but really it should have clicked that they have a slightly different model number for a reason. In any case, this chip has a different signature from the standard ATmega 328P, and so I needed to use a special boards library known as Minicore. Minicore has support for the 328PB chips, so it should have worked with this. But there was still an issue, and I'm not sure why. I know that the board I was using to flash the other board was good and capable of flashing, as I tested it on a pre-bought Arduino board and it flashed that one fine. But at one point during the design process, I remember reading some sentence somewhere about something not being able to be connected to the 328P while burning bootloaders. I can't remember where I saw it, what exactly it said, but I do remember seeing it and the fact that it stuck with me is what finally got the bootloader to flash. I took the board I've been trying to flash and hot air reflow soldered the chip onto another blank PCB that only had the crystal, the crystal's capacitors, and the reset pin pull-up resistor on it. I then tried flashing it on that board and it took the bootloader first try. Why did this work? I have no idea. Microcontrollers aren't something I'm extremely well versed in, at least when it comes to their inner workings and how to flash them and such, so if you know what's up with this, drop it in a comment as I'd love to learn why this was happening. Alright, we're in the clear now. 
We've got the bootloader burned to the chip, I've moved the chip back to the fully populated board, and now we can finally upload a Blink sketch to this thing. Or at least that's what I was thinking initially. But of course, there was still an issue. I could not get any code to upload to the board. Programmer settings, chip settings, board settings, none of them got the board to work and AVR dude kept giving a not in sync warning. I even tried using an external FTDI breakout board that I know for a fact works to program the board rather than using the onboard one in case that one had problems, but alas, it still wouldn't take. In addition to this, the FTDI chip on board kept being unsure of whether or not it wanted to work with the computer. I'd plug it in a couple times and it would recognize perfectly, but then it would randomly stop talking to the PC entirely. Sometimes it would come back, sometimes it wouldn't. I checked the solder joints, even replaced the USB-C connector, but no luck. I sat on this issue for about two hours, and as I'm sure some of us can understand, it was quite frustrating. So I decided that I'd try making an entirely new board from scratch to see if that would change anything. And this is when things went quite wrong. Failure is a standard occurrence in engineering and when building projects, and it's something that anyone who wants to get anywhere has to accept and learn from. Even though this is the case, I will say, when you're in the heat of the moment and the project you've been working on for several hours is refusing to work at all, greeting that failure with open arms isn't always the easiest. Because of this, I ended up wrecking the only other 328PB chip that I had when trying to solder it to the new board. I was too frustrated and put too much force sideways on a pin while fighting a solder bridge and ripped it off. Maybe I could take a super small wire and try to attach it to the side of the microcontroller on the small bit of metal still exposed, but I'm not sure as I haven't tried that yet. Oh, and did I mention yet that in my haste and frustration, I, once more, forgot to record that? Hopefully editor me figured out something to do for B-roll during those clips, but yeah, this pretty much marks the end of this project for the time being. I did buy enough chips to build three boards, but I've let one of my friends build one of them for himself, and so I'm not going to finish that board for him as he wants to solder it. I'll update in the comments if that board happens to work. In any case, for the time being, this project has been a bit of a failure, but that's okay. Failure happens, and I'm looking forward to some of your comments regarding what went wrong here and what I can do to fix it in the future. I'll definitely return to this project at some point because I want my USB-C nanos, dang it. Now, even though the functionality part of the project failed, I have to say that it was still a partway success. These PCBs from PCBWay offered me a great place to practice a ton of micro soldering. In fact, there are several hot air reflow AT Mega chip swaps that didn't make the final cut while I was troubleshooting. So I was at least able to practice a bunch of micro soldering and now I feel a lot more confident confident at working with components on this scale. Well, that's all that I have for you today. I hope you were able to at least enjoy my attempted project and maybe even learn a thing or two from my mistakes. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.